Thank you, Caleb and Eileen, leading our songs this morning, and we want to give you all a warm summer welcome to our graduation service, our worship service this morning. It's delightful to have you here, and I'm delighted that uh, we were even able to have a graduation. A couple of months ago, we weren't sure of even that, and uh, so even though it's uh, hampered uh, significantly, we and we wish we had another 100 or 200 people here, but uh, nonetheless, God is here, and we are a majority with him, aren't we? For our call to worship this morning, I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 36. <clears throat> Psalms 36, and we will read verses 5, 6, and 9, and 10. Psalm 36, beginning with verse 5. Thy mercy, O Lord, is in the heavens, and thy faithfulness reacheth unto the clouds. Thy righteousness is like the great mountains, and thy judgments are a great deep. O Lord, thou preservest man and beast. <clears throat> verse 9. For with thee is the fountain of life. In thy light shall we see light. O oh, continue thy loving kindness unto them that know thee, and thy righteousness to the upright in, in the heart. As I read these verses, I am reminded that um, the Lord preserves man and beast, old and young. And I'm thankful that he has preserved our young people, our seniors, our class that's graduating this year and um, brought them <clears throat> back to campus safely, and I'm thankful that uh, God is the source of mercy and light, protection, and we worship him in truth uh, this morning. By way of announcements, I'm not sure of any um, announcements. That, is, there, is there still a church board meeting planned this week? What night? Monday at 7. Monday at 7? Okay. Monday at 7 for a church board meeting. Um, <clears throat> while I have the mic, I thought I would just uh, introduce our speaker again. I know that uh, most of us know Brother Pruitt very well, having, uh, his having been here as a staff for many years, but uh, some may not. Um, Eugene is presently in the country of Malaysia, a little town called Ipoh, and he is, uh, has founded a mission training school there. 
similar to Washita Hills College. And we are uh, thankful that the Lord is using him. And uh, I was extremely blessed by his message last night. And I know that uh, God is going to speak through him again today. At this point, we will have um, Pastor Powell um, do the baptismal vows for those being baptized. Good morning and marvelous Sabbath to you. Rejuvenating Sabbath as well. You know, one of the biggest, well, the main reason for our existence as an institution is to be a part of God's last day movement to fulfill the Great Commission. It's about knowing Jesus and sharing him with others so that they will buy in with all their heart and seek to follow him fully. Uh, in Matthew 28, we see the Great Commission, and it begins with, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, or disciple, make disciples of all nations. And disciple is someone who follows someone, and it's making disciples of Jesus. In fact, while I'm speaking here, Dylene, if you could come forward, and Moses, um, while I finish reading this. And it says in verse 20, as a part of this great commission in Matthew's uh, uh, account of this, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. You know, what a beautiful thing that uh, as we seek to fulfill the great commission and also to disciple others to be doing that, uh, we have one who promises to be with us. What a blessing that we have God with us. Jesus with us, Emmanuel, to uh, not only help us understand his word and what he's calling us to do, but how to share that effectively with others too. And I am uh, grateful to have Moses and Dylene here. Moses, you've been here four years. I've seen you grow a lot in many different ways. <laughs> You're a lot taller than you used to be too <laughs> uh, when you came. Uh, but what a blessing to see you grow over the years. It's been an encouragement. I appreciated your helping the year before last as an RA, working with you closely with that. I appreciated the good job you did with that. And, and what, a, what a pleasure to be uh, a part of this weekend and see you making that public commitment to the Lord. You know, it's one thing to love Jesus. It's another thing to publicly say, I am his and he is mine. It's kind of like a, a marriage, if you will. And I wanted to read, and, and Dylene the same. You've been here two years, and uh, it's been a blessing getting to know you. It's been a, it's been a joy. And seeing, seeing your heart to, to be a missionary here, and wanting to see the real thing and, and, and be a source of God's real thing here. And that's been an encouragement to me. Um, I wanted to go over these vows with you. You can just kind of raise your hand for each one. Uh, but first, I wanted to ask two or three little questions, and that is, first, are you all convinced that you can do nothing good on your own, of yourself? All right? Okay. Uh, that's the first thing to understand, because until we do, we have nothing but failure to expect and trying hard and getting nowhere. Um, and then is it, uh, have, you, have you accepted Jesus as your personal savior from your sin? All right. And, and lastly, before I go over all the vows, summing it up, is it your purpose to follow Jesus according to his word as taught and understood by Seventh-day Adventists? All right. Okay. So I guess a nod of the head will work. <laughs> uh, oh, no, that's fine. All right, do you believe there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons? All right. Do you accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for your sins and believe that by God's grace through faith in his shed blood, you are saved from sin and its penalty? Amen. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, believing that God in Christ has forgiven your sins and given you a new heart? And do you renounce the sinful ways of the world? All right. 
You know, when, when we're doing weddings, I often have, if I'm doing a wedding and I've seen others do the same, we have the, the, the couples that are married in the audience hold hands and renew their vows. Hopefully, you all who have made these vows before can renew yours as, you, as we go here too. All right, uh, let's see. Do you accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, your intercessor in the heavenly sanctuary, and accept his promise of transforming grace and power to live a loving, Christ-centered life in your home and before the world? All right. Do you believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, the only rule of faith and practice for the Christian? Do you covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study? Amen. Do you accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of the character of God and a revelation of his will? Is it your purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep his, this law, including the Fourth Commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord and the memorial of creation? Do you look forward to the soon coming of Jesus and the blessed hope when this mortal shall put on immortality? As you prepare to meet the Lord, will you witness to his loving salvation by using your talents and personal soul winning endeavor to help others to be ready for his glorious appearing? Amen. Hopefully we are saying this, all of us are affirming these all right, number eight, do you accept the biblical teaching of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church? All right. Do you believe in church organization? Is it your purpose to worship God and to support the church through your tithes and offerings and by your personal effort and influence? Amen. Do you believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit and will honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful and abstaining from all unclean foods, from the use, manufacture, or sale of alcoholic beverages, from the use, manufacture, or sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption, and from the misuse of or trafficking in narcotics and other drugs? It's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do you know and understand the fundamental Bible principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church? Do you purpose by the grace of God to fulfill his will by ordering your life in harmony with these principles? Amen. Second to last, do you accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion and desire to be so baptized as a public expression of faith in Christ and his forgiveness of your sins? All right, amen. And do you accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy and that people of every nation, race, and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship? Do you desire to be a member of this local congregation of the World Church? All right, and since we are not an official meeting of the Amity Seventh-day Adventist Church, we will do the voting and so forth probably next Sabbath over there. But uh, what a blessing to uh, be a part of this with you both. And God bless you as you continue to go forward with Jesus. And I should mention to those watching online, we will have a Zoom link so that you can watch, uh, might be on YouTube as well. Uh, I don't think so. No. It'll okay. Just be on the Zoom link. It was sent out this morning to the stu students and their parents. Okay. So all the students and parents have received an email that has the link to Zoom. So you'll be able to to click on that link and forward it to others. And you could forward it to anyone else that you know would want to to be a part of it that might not have gotten the other email. And we So hopefully the information will be coming to you that are watching live right now uh, at the end of the service. All right, God bless each one of you as we continue to worship in spirit and in truth.
We will now sing one stanza of number 326, Open My Eyes That I May See. For those who do not have a hymnal, it's Open My Eyes That I May See, Glimpses of Truth Thou Hast For Me. Place in my hands the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee, ready my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Our Father in heaven, we're asking that you would join us this morning, that by your Holy Spirit, you would impress us in the very way that we ought to be impressed, that you would fill us in a way that we could reflect your thoughts, your feelings. We're asking that you would be our teacher that you would find a way to prevent those distractions that would interfere with your teaching. I ask for these gifts in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand together and sing our opening hymn this morning, Sound the Battle Cry, number 614. Oh, uh, sound the Battle Cry. Sabbath. We are indeed grateful to be here on this 29th 
uh, this 29th graduation ceremonies for Washington Hills Academy. Uh, in the 29 years, we have never had a graduation like this. <laughs> But um, we are nonetheless grateful for a graduation, and we are grateful that in those 29 years there's something, including today, that has remained the same. What is it? God has remained the same. He has not changed, and we can praise him today just as much as every other year that we have not had to wear masks and uh, social distance and et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> So this morning, we don't have a lot of time, but I want to take two praises and two prayer requests um, that somebody might want to say. We love to praise the Lord here at Washington Hills, and so if you have something you would like to especially thank the Lord for um, and praise Him for, raise your hand. We'll have somebody that can hold a mic for you. You don't have to touch it. Um, and we can hopefully take two praises and two prayer requests this morning. Do I see any hands okay? Eileen. So, uh, I really want to praise the Lord for the opportunity that, that he's given me to be back here once again, because um, the su whole summer has been a bit crazy, and um, I ha I've had the opportunity of being canvassing, and that has been an amazing experience, but there was a little bit of a moment where there were a few concerns on whether we we're going to be able to make there it because of quite like, a few moments. <laughs> well, yeah, and aside from, <laughs> aside from from like the other aside from you know everything that has been happening and uh, uh, even a couple of days right before we came, there was a question of whether we we're going to be able I to make see. it or not. Aside from <laughs> aside from everything that's been going on, you might not have been here anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, for for the cause of like uh, losing a couple of days of canvassing, but. It's been so amazing that the Lord has just been providing the ways for us to just make it here. And so I want to praise him because it's great to see everybody again. We praise the Lord that you are here, able to come, and that each of you are here. We wish it was multiplied many times over. We hope and pray that those watching online have many ways to be thankful that they can join us even though they're not here in person. And we hope there's many of those that were wanting to be here are able to do that. Anyone else that has a praise this morning? that uh, would like to share it this morning. I hope you all have a praise, but you just don't want to share it. <laughs> Otherwise, every hand should go up, shouldn't it? <laughs> okay, up here in the front, uh, Mrs. Glass. We all have things to be thankful for, and if we don't, we aren't. I'm thankful that four, four of our five children could come and be here, and thankful that... Grandpa Glass and and my mother over there in Weimar and my our fifth child at Weimar maybe can watch online. Uh, I Lord hope willing. So. I wish they could return uh, as well. We are grateful indeed. It's encouraging to see uh, your your family here. Uh, big blessings. Okay, two prayer requests this morning. Wish we could take more, and um, but uh, two prayer requests that you have a uh, burden. We are told we should bring him to, before the Lord to lay those burdens on him. He cares for us. And when we do so, we can enter into worship with greater relief, having given him that. And the body of Christ also uplifting those prayer requests to, to our Father. Anyone that has a prayer request? Oh, yes. Eugene. Turn his microphone on. I'd like you to pray for the call porters that are working this summer in Malaysia. There's a whole collection of them, and they can go a whole day without meeting a Christian, and to find the searching souls is what we'd like you to pray. God will help them do. Okay, a bit, tremendous work. How many are there? Are there? We can only take one team because of social distancing in the vehicles. I mean, you know, how so, you, you can't fill the vehicles. But so how many six. people is that? Six? Mm -hmm. Six people. All right. Well, those six are on the front lines doing a tremendous work. We'll pray for God to multiply that effort. It has to happen before Christ comes back, doesn't it? So we need to, we need to earnestly pray for that and pray that the Lord would send forth reapers into the harvest, right? Not laborers, but reapers. Well, I guess reapers are laborers, but... Uh, they're reaping, right? And that's what we need. Each one of you, that we our prayer for our seniors. I have, a prayer, I have a prayer request for our seniors this morning that the Lord would send them forth as reapers into his harvest. You know, if they graduate from here and are not a reaper, we have failed to some degree. They have personal choice, right? 
but um, that's our desire, our purpose, our goal, and our hope, certainly. Anyone else has a prayer request? Yes, Pastor Solaire. Yeah, I'm thinking about our seniors right now, graduating. Um, you're leaving, you'll be, God willing, putting into practice the very things that you've been learning here. Probably a lot of questions about uncertainty in a very uncertain time. Let's pray for them. Amen. They will experience everything the Lord has for them. Amen. How many have an unspoken prayer request this morning you would like to say, Lord, please take this burden. I want to lay it on you. He will remember those. Let's kneel together as we invite God's presence and pray for these requests. Father in heaven, our hearts are grateful that we are able to gather here. Although the circumstances change, we are grateful that you are a God that changeth not. We, you are the same yesterday, day, today, and forever. And by linking our lives with you, by committing our hearts and our, our lives to you, we find that constancy, that peace that passes all understanding. And we pray that that would fill our hearts today, that as we have re renewed those baptismal vows in our own heart of our commitment to you, that you as our God, our Savior, our Lord, our Redeemer, would be present here in us and in this room to speak to our hearts and to guide us, Father, today. We're grateful that your promise is where two or three are gathered together, your presence is there. And so we claim that promise, thanking you that your ear is, is attentive to the, hear, to the uh, prayer that is said in your house. And so we come with grateful hearts for um, returning the seniors here. Um, we are sad that all cannot return, all the students and many others as well, but we're grateful that we can celebrate their accomplishment. As Dylene has said, you've worked out those circumstances to allow them to come and to be here and for, all, for each of us. We're grateful for the glasses, their family, and uh, for those joining. I just pray for your blessing would also rest on those that join by, by watching online. We're grateful for the technology that we can share this time together, even though they're presently not here in person. Father, for the work that is going on around the world, especially for those in Malaysia, those canvassers that are, that are on the front lines working, what a tremendous challenge they, they face in a country that is at times hostile to uh, the message that they wish to share. I ask, Lord, that you would lead them and guide them to those people that are looking wistfully to heaven, that are uh, anxious to hear words of life, that we are told there are many around this globe that you have not heard and yet are still searching. And I pray that you would lead them and guide them and there might be fruit in, their, in your kingdom and that you would, they would hasten your soon return. Father, we also ask for our seniors as they wrap up these years of, of high school in their lives and are going on to either further education and continued work. Lord, I just pray that you would send them forth as reapers into your harvest. We are told that we should ask the Lord of the harvest that you would send forth reapers. And so, Father, right now we are pleading and asking that you would send forth these, these young ladies, these young men as reapers into your harvest, that they would have a love for souls. And as they go forth, they would take with them the, uh, the mission of Washington Hills to train young people to take the gospel to the world. And I ask, Lord, that you would work in their hearts and lives, guide them in their choices, guide them in the paths before them, and most importantly, guide them every day by your spirit into a deeper relationship with you. And so, Father, we ask this morning that your Holy Spirit would rest upon um, Mr. Pruitt, as he shares with us, uh, that again you would anoint him with uh, words to speak that would teach us, guide us, admonish us, but most importantly, draw us into a deeper love to Jesus. We want to thank you, Father, that we have this worship opportunity in freedom yet, and as the world marches on in confusion and much um, uncertainty and huge clashing of ideologies. I pray, Father, that we would experience a moment of peace, of unity, as we come to worship you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So one day, my mom was going to church with her family, right? And she carried a bag of hard candy. And on her way there, she was eating candy and eating candy and eating candy. And then when she got to the church, um, 
my grandma told her to stop eating the candy and that she wasn't going to eat candy in the church because the house of God is a sacred place and you should be eating inside there. So my mom said, yeah, that's fine. And, you know, she said she was she was going to obey and everything. And then while they were, like, doing song service, my mom sneakily, you know, popped another piece of candy in her mouth of hard candy. And then she started choking. And, like, nobody, like, was noticing. And then, you know, finally my grandma noticed. And then she was even bleeding. Like, she hurt her throat. And she started crying. And then, like, you know, all of a sudden you have all the um, members of the church around there because my mom was choking on a piece of candy. And um, then, you know, she learned her lesson that she wasn't supposed to be eating candy at home. And another incident, I think that was with my uncle or my dad, I don't remember who. But it was also on, um, on Sabbath and they were climbing trees and playing around, and then they told them, do not climb trees. But they still climbed trees, and they fell, and they hurt themselves. So what I want to tell you guys today is that if your parents tell you not to do something because it's dangerous, because it's Sabbath and you shouldn't be doing it, don't do it because then there's consequences and it's not cute. So yeah. <laughs> Um, Juan, do you want to pray for us? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you because um, <clears throat> you let us be here and because of the children's story and we have to learn like to like obey you so we don't have consequences. So thank you because you let us here be in your Sabbath and we have to be reverent and, and in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. <clears throat> um, directly behind me, on the other side of this wall, lies a vision. And it's a vision of a, a chapel, an auditorium, a sanctuary, twice this size right here that will provide for the needs of the school and for service and mission. It also will provide for using this space right here to create other classrooms that are really badly needed here so that our academy and our college can meet comfortably with sufficient rooms. That vision is partially fulfilled. There are actually walls behind paint that's been added, electric, and different things that has been run. And the Lord demonstrated his will for this to be done, recognizing the great need, by providing the funds, the people with the, the desire to help out, and so forth. But then the work has been stopped. It kind of reminds me of the rebuilding of the temple and the walls of Jerusalem and so forth during the time of Nehemiah, Ezra, etc. It was for a later generation to fulfill the vision. And this morning we'd like to bring before you the vision to see if the Lord would lay it on your heart to help fulfill the vision. Has the time come? Could you be the one that the Lord will use to fulfill this vision that he has and that he has given us here? And so the sanctuary, the, the, the walls, they lay waiting for the funds, for the completion. And I pray that you would consider helping with this very special project. Um, right in front of me, there's a basket right there. And as you exit, uh, you'll have the opportunity to be able to turn in your tithes and offerings. There are envelopes close by if you haven't already availed yourself of those envelopes to put the tithes and special offering. Anything that is loose, the loose offering, or should the Lord lay on you to uh, write a little, put your name on a little piece of paper with a certain amount, um, you can just put it in the basket and we'll gladly receive that. Okay, with that in mind then, let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, thank you so much 
for all the ways that you have provided. Uh, COVID, unemployment, these things don't prevent you from acting in the gracious and wonderful way that you do. And we, we're here to praise you and thank you, Lord. So we come returning a token of your blessing to us. And then, Lord, from hearts moved with gratitude and with faith, we also bring before you special offerings. Pray that you will bless those offerings that uh, will be committed to the fulfilling of this special vision to enhance the ministry of Washita Hills. Thank you for your goodness to us. In the blessed, worthy, and generous name of Jesus, amen. If you open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 42, verses 19 to 21, I'm going to read together with it. I'm going to read with you um, these words of the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 42, verses 19 to 21. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as he who is perfect, and blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but you do not observe, opening the ears, but he does not hear? The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness' sake. He will exalt the law and make it honorable. All right, good morning again. Well, um, before, I wanted to introduce our piece before we played it. We're going to be playing a quintet. And it was arranged after the song called Trust and Obey. But the composer of the piece wanted to bring out a different message. Because, you know, sometimes when we're trying to, when we're trying our best for God and really trying to stay within His will, Sometimes you, you can't always see the light at the end of the tunnel. Sometimes the clouds are blocking the sun, and you don't know exactly what's going to happen next. You have doubt and fear for the future, and you really don't know what's going to happen next. But in the Course it says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus.
when we went to Malaysia five years ago to start a little training school, our plans, or my plans, when I went, are not highly related to what happened afterwards. Uh, what I thought I was going for was to train underground Chinese missionaries, ones that would come from China, study in Malaysia, and then return to work where it's dangerous. And it is dangerous in China. My wife and I listened to a sermon just a couple of years ago of a man who had just got out of prison after several years in prison for doing God's work in China. And he was so excited, so full of energies, he shared about how glad he was to be free. But it was just a few weeks later when he returned to China, he was captured again and put in prison again. It is dangerous to work in China. But we weren't able to do that work because immigration in Malaysia changed about the same time we arrived there and the Chinese couldn't get visas to come. So that meant that I began looking for ways to recruit Malaysian students. I mean, not all of you are involved in recruiting, but those who are know that it's just one of the more difficult parts of educational work today. And we went about it, and to make the story short, we found students, and during our very first semester, when we only had six students, one of them, a courageous young man, sold a great controversy to a Malay lady. And after he left the home, her nephew came to visit her and saw a Christian book in her house. It made him extremely angry. And when he found out that the man who sold it was Iranian, it made him even more angry to think an apostate was promoting apostasy. And he began to raise a mob to attack the call porter student, maybe to kill him. Someone thankfully called the police. Police can be a real blessing when there's a mob. I tell you, if you have to choose between police and mob, go with the police every time. The police came and they rescued my students by putting them in jail. And, um, and I'm so glad that my students went to jail because it very much changed the nature of recruiting in Malaysia. Where it was easy before, it was hard after. And those that have come since then are the highest quality of students. Or else they're not even Adventist. If they're not Adventist, then they don't hear about all the reasons not to come. So that some of them come. And we, we have every year now non-Adventists come to enroll in our mission training program. But they're always Adventists by the end of the year. So that little jail experience uh, made parents very wary. I mean, they were very hesitant. That is such an understatement. Very hesitant to let their children come study in our program. And it didn't help that two years later, we went to jail again. It didn't help. Although I'm so glad we did. But... It wasn't just parents that had a hard time with the fact that we were trying to reach the majority population. It's against the law. I think I told you that last night. It's against the law to reach out to Muslims in Malaysia. It wasn't just the parents. The organization that invited me there to start the Chinese Missionary Training School, uh, a very effective health ministry organization, ANON, they were really fearful that our work for Muslims was going to get them shut down. I mean, I'm not sure what would happen here at Washita if laws changed so that canvassing became very illegal and there was a great danger that canvassers would lead to the shutting down of the school. It might even change the plans of the school regarding canvassing. I don't know what would happen. But Anon really felt like our work was a danger to their ministry. Can you understand their perspective? And so they told me over and over to stop. I never agreed. I just stayed quiet. I don't think I stayed quiet, but I never agreed. And in December of 2018, 
they finally realized that they were making no progress, and that was a few months after our second jailing, and they decided that they'd need to give me an ultimatum, and they did. The executive committee called me in. I was on the executive committee up till that day, not after. And uh, in that meeting, they let me know that either we would have to stop, cease, quit, trying to reach the majority population, or we would have to leave their campus now let me tell you what Anon was to us at that point. It was our staff housing, it was our cafeteria, it was our classes, it was our student housing, it was a, about a third of our teaching force. That's a pretty big part of a, of a school. And they said, you either have to quit or you have to leave. And if we would think about that purely from logistics, that would be quit or quit. Because we can't operate without a campus. Do you remember the scripture reading that was read about seven minutes ago? Well, what it said is, who is blind is my servant, seeing many things, but he doesn't pay attention, he hears many things, but he doesn't listen. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. I think young men and young women, and old men and old women, and children who might be watching by Zoom, that you can't afford to pay attention to everything. You can't afford to watch everything. If you pay attention to everything, it's going to paralyze you at some point. If you pay attention to everything, it's going to stop the work. And what I told that executive committee, because I knew what was coming, I knew what was coming at the meeting before the meeting happened. I had time to think about it. What I told them is that the first angel's message doesn't give us an option how to answer this question. You know what it says to every kindred and nation and tongue and people. It doesn't give us an option. So when I said we can't stop, I wasn't saying I know where we're going or I know how, how to go forward. I wasn't saying that at all. I was only saying that we can't stop. Well, a nice lady who lived there at Anon, who I won't say her name, she approached me after the meeting because it, was, it wasn't very long before the whole campus knew that we were going to be leaving. She said, 20 years ago, I was given five acres of land. It was purchased for me. It was purchased to start a health center, and we haven't built anything on it at all. It's just been sitting there unused. You can use that land. Well, that's very nice. Wouldn't you agree that's very nice? I mean, you might not know, but Malaysia is one of those places like islands of the sea where the price of land is ridiculously high, where because of investors, it just goes beyond what is any sensible bound. That happens in many islands, and it's happened in Malaysia. The cheapest land available there now is fifteen dollars to $20,000 an acre. That's the cheapest land. So to get five acres offered to us is a greater gift than all the fundraising I had done before that in my entire life. In other words, if you take all the money I ever raised before that, well, in the five minutes after the meeting, what I was offered was more. So it was quite encouraging. It wasn't expected. It was just encouraging. So we took our student body up there and we rented some homes that were two kilometers from the property. And uh, we moved our whole school to those homes and began having classes in the living rooms of some of those homes. And we spent our days, this is a year and three months ago now, we spent our days clearing that jungle five acres, uh, putting in a road, 
but we put in a well, we improved the road to get to it, and we put in some fruit trees, and we got a bulldozer, and we, we leveled some land for building, and we were raising money as fast as we could, writing people and asking please to help us. And people gave tens of thousands of dollars. But Malaysia isn't Thailand. It's not the Philippines. It's not Indonesia. That is, all those three countries are substantially more poor than Malaysia. They come to Malaysia to earn money the way that Mexicans come to the U.S. to earn more money. Uh, Malaysia, the typical person in Malaysia is earning about a th- $800 to $1,000 a month for a white-collar job, where in the Philippines it'd be $100 to $200 a month. So it's quite different. And that means things are more expensive there. So anyway, we received that money and we got busy using it. And uh, then last summer, we finally got permission after we hired an architect to design our building and applied to the state for permission to to build and the state granted the permission. And before we're gonna begin building, I decided that we'd ask the lady who owned that property, who offered it to us, I'd ask her for a very formal long-term lease. You know, I don't wanna put down a foundation without a very formal legal long-term lease. So I went to her, this is last May. I don't mean May as in three months ago, but as in 15 months ago. And I was shocked when she told me, I'm sorry, you can't use the property. I said to her, this isn't the right time to say that. We've already invested thousands of hours in clearing and planting and improving. We've already hired the architect and already applied for permission to build. If you want to say that, it is your land, but you should have said it like five months ago. It's not the right time. Let me tell you why she said it. It's because one of the Malay people in Malaysia that has become a Seventh-day Adventist lives about five kilometers from her house. And that lady that became an Adventist after leaving Islam, when we moved away, she suddenly felt alone. I don't know if you could imagine. I heard a young lady up here this morning talking about being alone. Well, if you have just left Islam to become an Adventist and all your friends move five hours away, you know how you feel? And her family is violent and they've beat her many times. Even after she was an adult, they were still beating her. And, well, I don't blame her, but she decided to run away from her family. And when she ran away, she gave me a call, and she said, can I come? Meaning, can she come where we are? Well, what do you think? What are we going to say? We said, yes, you can come. And so she came. Well, what happened is when she ran away, her father, who was a police officer, went to Anon looking for her. You know, asking about where is she? Where is my daughter? And you know what having a, an aggressive, angry police officer on campus, you know how that feels? Scary. And it scared the missus that owned our five acres. It scared her just a few hours before I contacted her to ask for the lease agreement. And hence she said, no, I changed my mind. You can't have it. You know, I'd never asked for that land. She had volunteered it. I didn't even know it existed when she volunteered it. We had moved to the village near the land because of the offer of the land. That's why we were there. But while we were there, we began to make contacts. We've been giving Bible studies to so many people there. Well, let me fast forward because I do have a Bible study for you and this isn't it. God has given us another piece of land. 
But this land that was taken away from us was adjacent on two sides to a swamp. But the land that we've been given now, that we actually own, like we've bought it with money, so it's ours, is a hilltop, the highest point in every direction. You can see in every direction from it. But that land that was taken from us was four kilometers or three from electricity. And the cost of getting the electricity taken out there was going to be astronomical. But the hilltop we're on is shared with a cell tower. So the electricity is already there. And the road to the land that was taken from us was so bad that a number of the, the vehicles that I needed to go out there for the building process couldn't do it. But the place we are now has a state improved road that's only one kilometer from pavement. It's just altogether better. What I'm trying to say by an illustration is that when we had to make the decision whether to stop reaching the majority population, if we had opened our eyes to all the reasons to not follow the first angel's message, we could have found sufficient reasons. We could have found reasons like, we don't have anywhere else to go. We don't have any money. These are the people who own the property. We don't own it, so they obviously can choose what they want to do here. It's not our choice. It's not our choice. We don't have money. We don't have anywhere to go. Plus, there are plenty of Buddhists to reach. There are plenty of Hindus to reach. So if we were looking for reasons, we could have found sufficient reasons to say, okay, we give up, we'll stop. What I'm saying to you is you can't afford to look at the reasons. I mean, if the reasons are reasons to disregard what God says, you can't afford to look at them. If you have reasons not to obey, you can't afford to pay attention to them. You can't afford it. Oh, you can't afford it. Let me tell you just a wee bit more about this story. So, you know, to build a building costs a lot of money. I didn't have any clue how much. I've never built a building before. When I was on the board of Washita and they would talk about building buildings, I would almost zone out. I know so little, I can't even make a meaningful contribution. And now I'm in charge of, you know, trying to develop one. I'm out of my element. But I sent out a fundraising letter asking for money to build the building and Cindy Tooch, who some of you might know, uh, Cindy and I had the, the interesting distinction before 2015 of both having written a book on women's ordination. I wrote one published by Amazing Facts that was against women's ordination. She wrote one published by the NAD that was in favor of women's ordination. You know, th that's us, we wrote the two books. But before women's ordination came up, we had been friends because we both liked the call porter work. You know, we'd both been involved in that. And so why would you let theological differences ruin a friendship? And so after 2015, when the vote was done, by God's providence, Cindy and I walked out of the General Conference Auditorium together. We weren't sitting together. We just, you know, if you were there, you walk out with people and you, it's not related to where you were sitting. And... Um, and we shook hands and we agreed that we're done with this topic. I have other things to preach about than women's ordination. So anyway, she's on, our, on my list of people that ask for money and she's not wealthy by any means. And so I sent her our fundraising letter. This, this must be about 10 months ago, September, whenever that was compared to now. And she wrote back and said, I can't help out this time. She has given money to help our work in Malaysia. She said, I can't help out this time, but I'm going to send your letter to someone who probably can. 
So she knows she forwarded our fundraising letter to someone who I didn't know. And he wrote me back the next day. In my fundraising letter, I thought the amount of money we needed for the building was about $200,000. That's what I thought. He wrote back the next day and said, I'm sending a check for $200,000. Well, you know how I told you that the five acres was more than everything I ever raised before that? Well, that 200,000 was more than the five acres and everything else before and after that. It doesn't even seem so big to me now as it did eight months ago. Because God has helped us to raise almost $900,000. And it's not because I'm so good at raising money. It's only because we can't afford to look at the reasons not to do the things that need to be done. We can't afford to look at the reasons not to do the things that God says. Like, it could have seemed very reasonable not to go the right way, but it's never reasonable not to go the right way. It's never reasonable to go the wrong way. Well, that girl, you know, the one that, whose dad was looking for her, she was baptized a little over a year ago. I was there, it was up in a mountain in the jungle, it was a beautiful experience. But the police know about her. And about five, oh, I gotta re recount my months now, I, I forget I spent three of them in South Africa. About six months ago now, um, I got a call from my friendly police officer. I went out of my way to make friends with the local police up where we live. I visited them before they visited me. And I went to talk to them and just to try to head off problems. I even threatened to report them to the Anti-Corruption Commission because they were harassing illegal workers and taking bribes from them. And I said, you can't be doing that. It's not right. And I made a police report against them in their own office. Because they're not all corrupt, but some of them are. And it's just, it's just really, it, feel, it felt bad to see officers coming to our village and all they talk to are people who are obviously foreigners and, you know, to get money. It, it, just, it just, it feels unjust. Well, I'm so glad I went there because I made friends with some good officers and one of them called and told me uh, I'm not sure why, but six of my superior officers, some of them from the, the capital, Kuala Lumpur, are going to want to come meet you. When my friends in Malaysia found out that six ranking officers were coming to talk to me, uh, they let me know that there was a good chance I was about to be arrested. I've never been worried about being arrested. Like going to jail just sounds like vacation to me. <laughs> and, um, but I do worry some about the work. I don't want the work to suffer and uh, you know, the work's important. And so I did pray about it and think and pray and, and get ready. And so the six officers arrived and they're in my living room now and, and uh, they're more or less friendly to be honest with you. And one of them, the lead ranking officer, her name is Julia, she had never even heard of Seventh-day Adventist. She told me, this is in front of her fellow officers, that she had studied comparative religions in university. And the only Christianity she ever learned about was Catholicism. And this was so interesting to her to find that there's something else. And they knew we sold books and it, it wasn't any conniving on my part, it was just a coincidence, I suppose. But the only books I had in my house at the time were English health books that they could read and Chinese spiritual books that they couldn't because they can't read Chinese. 
So I had Chinese Ministry of Healing and Chinese Great Controversy, but I didn't have English GC and Ministry of Healing there. Uh, they were at a different house in the same village. So they asked, what books are you selling? So I pulled out the ones I had, I showed it to them. I even told them about the Chinese ones because I knew they can't read them. And it's no threat, you know, because there's nothing, there's nothing illegal in Malaysia of selling the Great Controversy to Chinese people. That's perfectly legal to do. But Julia asked me, point blank, do you have these in English? Well, what do you think the answer to that is? The answer is yes. I told her the truth. And she said, could we see them? So I asked my wife to go get them. You know, it was about a 10 minute walk there and back and she came back and every one of those officers took a ministry of healing, all six of them. But Julia also took a great controversy. I've been in correspondence with her ever since that time. I wouldn't say that Julia is necessarily searching, but she sure is open-minded. She sure has asked me to pray for her numerous times. She's been searching on the internet. She's learned about Christians with a Muslim background. She sent me data about it. She sent me a link to where people are praying for Muslims. Julia is a Muslim. I don't know if you gathered that, but she is. And I know that she's thinking and I hope you'll be praying for Julia because God may have arranged for her to meet the one person in her country that actually would openly share with her the truth. For Julia's sake, you can't afford to pay attention to everything. You can't afford to think about everything or you're not going to do the right thing. I'm still getting to that Bible study. Just give me a moment. In Germany, I was speaking, and after the sermon, a, a feisty young lady came up to me and rebuked me right there in the hallway for something I never even taught. She just assumed I taught it. It was so shameful of her. Anyway, she is a convert from Islam to Adventism. She was converted in jail she was in jail for, for being part of a planning process of terrorism. And it was in jail she learned about the truth. And now she, has a, she had, had a burden when I was there to make sure that I'm teaching the right thing about the Quran, which is that it's not a good book. And anyway, that is what I teach. So we're, we were on the same page. And as soon as she knew we were on the same page, she wasn't so feisty anymore. Her name is Jerry. So I went back to Malaysia. And a short time later, Jerry wrote me because she was in contact. Jerry had a courage, I'll tell you what she did. She made a series of YouTube videos of herself telling of her experience of going from Islam to Adventism. She used a pseudonym, but she used her real face. And she left contact information there for her. And someone in Malaysia that was an Indonesian worker watched her videos. His name is Roji, and I'll tell you God had to help Roji because Roji, when he was a teenager, was given a Bible by a friend in high school. And then when he went to Malaysia, he didn't bring it because he was afraid to take it across the border. So he'd been working for eight years without his Bible and he missed it. And one day he decided to go on YouTube and try to find something about the Bible. And if you go on YouTube to find something about the Bible, woe is you. But somehow he found Jerry's testimony, a miracle from heaven that Roji found it. And he watched all those videos and decided he wanted to become a Seventh-day Adventist, never having met one in his entire life. So he wrote to her and she called me. And I bought a ticket and flew to meet him. And I uh, gave him a Bible. And he wanted to be baptized right there, but he's addicted to tobacco, but he was when I met him. And uh, so I told him that baptism is a symbol of the end of the old life. So we want the symbol to follow the reality. So let's wait till after you overcome tobacco before we baptize you. And also he didn't know much. And so that we began giving him studies. I found someone who would study with him that was very great. And Roji studied and learned and he lost his job over the Sabbath. 
and had to go back to Indonesia because he didn't have a work permit anymore. And, um, and he was making good progress and he overcame tobacco and he was ready to come study in our Indonesian school, the one where Daniel Gomez is working. And then on June 18, 2018, so it's just over two years ago now, I'm very certain now that Roji was killed by his ex-wife and son. But when he told his wife that he had become a Christian, she divorced him the same week. I didn't tell you that, but it was the same week. And uh, I had several lines of communication open to Roji, uh, email and messenger and WhatsApp, and he knew that I had about $1,200 that I'd raised to help his children go to university that I hadn't sent. And, uh, and he just, all his forms of communication ended the same day. Nothing. One ticks, if you understand what I mean by WhatsApp. It all ended. I hired a lady that had been a childhood friend of him to go and find him. And the way she was treated by the family just confirm my worst fears. I really am quite confident that Roji was murdered by his family. So how do I feel about that? I'm looking forward to meeting him in heaven. I would rather that he die faithful than that he die in the dark. Rather, he die faithful than live to an old age in darkness. But if I thought about it the wrong way, I could talk myself out of trying to reach someone else. Do you see how that could happen? You can't afford to think about some things. Reasons to not do what God says, you can't afford to think about them. You can't afford to listen. If you think about the reasons not to do what God says, Satan will have enough for you. Now the Bible. Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Last night I talked about that motto, death before dishonor. Now I want to talk about that aim, elevating the standard. Elevating the standard. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and looking at verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land where you go to possess it. Keep for that reason and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Let's read this backwards now. Here are the nations looking at you, and what makes them think that you're smart? It's that you're following what God says so thoroughly. That's what makes them think you're so smart. Which will hear all these statutes. Oh, they won't think that's why unless you're sharing with them what you know. Which will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what nation is there so great who has God so close to them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and keep your soul diligently. What I want you to see in these few verses is that the standards that God has given us as a people are not obstacles between us and evangelism. Do you see in these verses that the standards are not obstacles? Quite on the contrary, in these verses, the standards are tools. They are assets to you. In these verses, it's the great wisdom God has given us that is the, you know, the word standard. When we talk about standards in the church, we're kind of mixing two different metaphors, but they mix so nicely. 
I mean, one of those is the standard of a flag. That's a standard right there, the American standard. And the other is the standard of a benchmark. You know how you measure things? But both of those are metaphors that fit really nicely with the values we have as a church. I mean, those values are a benchmark. You can see how someone is learning and growing and progressing by the way they modify their life. But really, in Deuteronomy, they're this kind of standard. All those nations that hear these things, it's amazing to Buddhists and Muslims and Hindus to find people who live 10 to 15 years longer and don't spend those 15 years in a nursing home. It's amazing the things that we have, the wisdom that God has given us. When I'm talking to Muslims in Malaysia and Indonesia, and you could do this in Jordan too, I haven't been to all countries, I don't know if it's true in all countries, but in those three, it's true that Adventism and Islam have something in common. They both teach that smoking is a no-no. But the difference is, if you find a hundred men in the Adventist church, only two of them will smoke on the sly. But if you find a hundred of the men in Malaysia, Indonesia, or Jordan, about 70 of them are smoking, of the Muslims. That is, here are two religions, they both say the same thing, but only one of them comes with power. If you talk about their values that they profess, they're quite similar. If you talk about the values of what they practice, they're quite different. So that all religions say you shouldn't beat the ladies. All religions say that, but they don't have similar experiences with that. I think you understand what I'm trying to say. There's a difference. When we talk about exalting the standard, it's not so you can look special to your fellow Adventist. It's so God's wisdom can be waved in front of people who've only seen foolishness before this time. So some of you are gonna be going to university someday and you're gonna be taking secular studies I don't condemn people for taking secular studies, but I say, why in the world would you do it in the United States? It doesn't make any sense to me why you'd go to school here, when you could go to school for less money somewhere else, get the same degree, and have almost all of your classmates be people who've never met a Christian in their life. Why would you study here? If you'll come to Malaysia, there are four universities within a half hour of us, you can get your PhD in whatever there, and at the same time, help us plant a church. You know, you know who comes to Malaysia to study in the university? It's people from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, Iraq and Iran, uh, Yemen especially, that they come there. And Iraqians and Iranians get along just fine in university. In Malaysia, get along just fine. The fact that, they're, that their grandparents might be angry at each other doesn't do anything for the children. But right there in Malaysia, they come because many of those that come from very conservative countries want to study in a liberal country. You know, the same way how someone who goes to Washington Hills Academy might want, go to a, want, might want to go to a liberal college. Something like that is a very similar type of pressure going on there. And so if you come from Iran to study in Malaysia, it feels like a lot of freedom. So people come to Malaysia to study and it makes an opportunity for you to reach people who you'll never meet any other way. I did not intend for this to be an advertising program for Malaysia. <laughs> it's just an idea. There are lots of other places you could do something useful. But what I want to say is that you can't afford to pay attention to everything. If you're going to exalt the standard, let me tell you things that are going to go against you. It's going to look like it's going to kill you financially, it's gonna kill you socially. I mean, people, if you're going to hold up a high standard, it's gonna cost you at every step. It's costly. And I'm just saying, please don't pay any attention to those costs. Because you just don't know how expensive it is to go the wrong way. I was thinking this morning about high values. This will be my last thought, then I'll review and close. About high values, and I think when we talk about Deuteronomy 4, and 
Isaiah 49, it's important to make a distinguishment. Is that a word, distinguishment? Anyway, to distinguish. It's important to distinguish between values that come from the prophets and values that come from research. There's a reason. It's because the ones that come from the prophets, they highlight God's wisdom. But the ones that come from research, they highlight your wisdom. Half the time, the other time they highlight your foolishness. Uh, let me try to say this, with that. let me say it less theoretically and more practically. The idea that you should eat a vegetarian diet, that comes from the prophets. You can hold that up, you can use that one. The idea that you should eat only raw food, that comes from your research. Shoddy research, if you ask me. Uh, but it might seem to you like quality research, but it doesn't come from the prophets. It's not the prophets that said only eat raw food. So if you hold that up, what you're holding up is the value of the researchers. I'm saying what really works in evangelism is holding up the value of the prophets. So it, it is sensible from the prophets that we have school industries. Isn't that plainly revealed in Ellen White's writings about our schools that they should have industries? Plainly revealed. But the idea that we should avoid vaccines at all hazards, that's not from the prophets. I don't mean that it's a good idea and I don't mean that it's a bad idea. I'm not even trying to get on the vaccine topic, except to say it's not from the prophets. And what do we want to exalt before the people? The prophets. It's the, it's the prophets, it, that's the wisdom of God. And when we exalt the wisdom of God, people can see it's the wisdom of God. When we exalt our own research, it looks like we're the bright ones or it looks like we're the foolish ones, depending, because our own research is hit and miss when it comes to conclusions. Like in a group this size, I bet you there are 15 anti-vaxxers and 15 pro-vaxxers that both have done their own research. And to, the, to those two groups of 15, they both look foolish to the others. But when you use God's wisdom, there's something reliable about that. My own life was saved by a vaccine. And I don't want to be vaccinated, so there I just pleased both of you. <laughs> uh, I was bitten by a rabid bat when I was a baby. So I've been given the rabies vaccine in the belly, and that was a great development for me. It's why I'm still alive today. So the summary of all I've said today is that if you want to exalt the law of God and make it honorable, if you want to elevate a standard, let me give you some ideas about that, two of them. One thing is go forward without counting the, the reasons not to follow God's counsel. I mean, should you count the cost? You should count the cost in the sense of whether you're going to serve God or not. But if you're going to serve him, you should do what he says regardless of the cost. You can't afford to think about the reasons not to do what he says. And that second thought is, be sure that for yourself that you know the difference between the standards that come from the prophets and the ones that come from research. I didn't say between the ones that are true and the ones that are false, because you're probably convinced that they're both true. But I mean between the sources. Be sure you get a difference. And which one do we want to hold up? Which one is our wisdom in the sight of the nations? It's the wisdom from the prophets. They've told us a lot about health. They've told us a lot about, about schools. They've told us a lot about entertainment and recreation. Why, the prophets have given us plenty of information. We can hold that up and we can be wise. And if we will, I think you'll find that God will put you on a hilltop, that he'll make you a light in a dark place, that he'll wave you as a flag, and he'll draw to himself those that will come to him. Do you remember Hebrews 7.26? It's about Jesus as our high priest, and it says he's made higher than the, higher than the heavens. Jesus is the one that you can exalt. He is the source of the wisdom. He's the one who is honored by the wisdom. And he is the one that when we speak of him and think of him, 
All of heaven draws close to, to soften and subdue hearts. We can't afford to be ashamed of dear Jesus, to be afraid of sharing him with Julia. We can't be afraid to share him with Roji or with Monica. If we're afraid, we're going to be crippled. And if we're crippled, we're useless. And if we're useless, what a waste. Let's elevate the standard. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 316, Live Out Thy Life Within Me. Number 316, let's stand together as we sing. Father, it has indeed been a pleasure to be in your presence this morning. Our heart's desire as we've seen the sacrifice and the service and the willingness to, to give all for you has been inspired. We have been inspired and we want to let you live out your life within us. Go with us now to, to the uh, baptismal service throughout the rest of this weekend's meetings and we pray that we might be daily walking with you and doing your work and your will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are so pleased you could join us for the special event here at Watch the Hills Academy and College. If you have enjoyed this presentation as much as I have, like, share, and subscribe. Also, if you would like to help support the making of these programs, you can find the donation information in the description below. Thank you for joining us and may God richly bless you.